ज्ञानम परमम ध्येयम नॉलेज इज सुप्रीम Okay, so as I have already said, the operators of compatible observables satisfy commutator a comma b equal to zero. There could be a set of compatible observables with a a comma b to be zero. Okay, this condition, what does it mean in the context of measurement? I had already told you when you do the measurement on an arbitrary state psi of t. It will collapse to one of the eigenstate of that operator, right? So this condition will imply that if you first measure a operator on an arbitrary state, it will collapse to some eigenstate of the a operator. If you try to measure the b operator on that, this what will it give? So the claim is it will give the same the order. If you do it in this order or the other order, the result which you will get will be whatever measurement you get for A and B will be the same. So for finite dimensional linear vector space, I've always stressed the fact that you can write for these operators a matrix representation. And if you write a matrix representation, then two matrices commutator being zero. Means that you can simultaneously diagonalize the matrix. So if you have A B equal to B A, suppose let's take two by two matrices. This is the meaning of A commutator B equal to zero. If phi one and phi two are the bases. Eigen basis of A operator. What does that mean? Phi one is lambda one phi one, or let me call it as A one phi one. A on phi two is A two on phi two. Let's use this on the state. Let's do that on that state. So A. On B on phi one, equal to B A on phi one. But A on phi one is A one. A one is a number, eigen value. B operator on what have I got? What is this equation? See the extreme left and the extreme right. B on phi one is also an eigen vector of A operator with the same eigen value A one. So B on phi one should be proportional to. They are non-degenerate eigen values, eigen states. You can't have two different. What does that tell me? That B on phi one should be proportional to phi one. That's it. Or B will also share the same eigen basis of A operator. So what have I tried to prove here? I have tried to use the fact that it is compatible observable, or the corresponding operators are commuting. Once I take the corresponding operators as commuting, then I get an equation which is like an eigen value equation. For simplicity, we have taken a two-dimensional. Linear vector space and a matrix representation with the two cross two matrices. Take the basis which is an eigen basis of A, which is non-degenerate. A one and A two are not equal, and in the process you find another eigen state B phi one, and that means for the completeness of this two-dimensional linear vector space, B phi one should be proportional to phi one, or equivalently, we have proved that B operator on phi one is some B one times phi one. So this means both A and B can have the same 
This can be eigenbases of A and B, which is what we call it as a simultaneous, simultaneous eigenbases of A and B. You can't do this if they don't commute. You can do this only if they commute. And we are also assuming the fact that both the eigenvalues of A operator and B operator are non-degenerate. You could have had the same eigenvalue with a different linearly independent state. That case we are not considering. We'll come to that. So I've proved for you that for finite dimensional linear vector space, we can have matrix representation for the compatible observables which can be simultaneously diagonalized. Now you are clear? When I say it is the simultaneous eigenbasis, it means that given an A operator and B operator which are two cross two matrices, you can find, so you can find, you have an operator, how do you diagonalize the matrix? You try to find some S matrix, similarity transformation which will give you a diagonal matrix, right? Matrix mechanics, everybody has done. Now the claim is that this S matrix is the one which gives you the eigenvectors. So when I say they are simultaneous eigenvectors, it means it's the same S matrix which should also operate on this, which will give you the B diagonal. Cannot be a different S matrix. Both A and B are simultaneously diagonalized by the same diagonalizing matrix, which gives you the two eigenvectors, which are the same eigenvectors for both B. The earlier statement was if you do two consecutive measurements, A followed by B, A measurement, and then followed by B, the final result which you get will be the same as doing B followed by A. The order does not matter. That's what is the first thing. The second statement is the commuting operators in a finite dimensional vector space need not be two dimensional, even in an n dimensional n cross n matrices. You can simultaneously diagonalize by the same similarity matrix, which means the eigenbasis of A and eigenbasis of B will be one and the same. So this is the first case which I said for the two cross two matrices. Assume eigenvalues A or A I of A are distinct. Distinct means they are non-degenerate. And similarly, eigenvalues B I of B are distinct. Okay, so both are non-degenerate. This is a very special situation. You could have situations where some operators may have two eigenvalues being same, which will give you the degenerate situation. Right? Energy eigenvalues, for example. When you look at a particle in a two-dimensional box, if you look at the first excited state, there are two linearly independent states, right? With nx equal to 1 and ny equal to 2, or nx equal to 2 and ny equal to 1 in a two-dimensional particle in a box, where you will have the same energy eigenvalue, nx comma ny, Formally, these are various notations where you can have the Hamiltonian operator for a particle in a two dimensional box which will give you E n x squared plus n y squared. If n x equal to 1 and n y equal to 2, this energy will be E. Pi. If nx equal to 2, ny equal to 1, this is also E5. But that state which I write, nx equal to 1, ny equal to 2, is not proportional to, is not proportional to some constant times nx equal to 2, ny equal to 1. They are linearly independent. In fact, you can explicitly show that nx equal to 1, ny equal to 2, and nx equal to 2, ny equal to 1 is a 
zero or not zero? You say it's linearly independent and you are looking at a basis which are orthonormal basis, then this is. So this is a degenerate situation. One observable A, if I take it to be an energy operator for a two-dimensional particle in a box, that will be a degenerate situation. I'm not looking at the situation. I'm looking at one dimensional particle in a box. Let's say that there are two operators. Each of the eigenvalues, the position operator, for example, in a one dimensional box, it's going to be distinct energy eigen, sorry, position eigenvalue. But there could be situations like this, some functional operator. You can have a functional operator as x squared plus y squared. Then all the points on the circle will have the same eigenvalues. The states will be different. So that's where you will start seeing degenerate, non-degenerate. Just for simplicity, let's look at most of the 2 cross 2 matrices or 3 cross 3 matrices. Let's take all the eigenvalues of A operator are distinct. No two eigenvalues are same. And similarly, eigenvalues BI of B are distinct. What will happen when you do the measurement now? Suppose you do a measurement of the operator A or observable corresponding to the operator A. On arbitrary style, so I've just replaced your phi n by just n or phi k by k. Okay? So this is just to further simplify notation. Don't worry about why we are not writing. So we are going to always write instead of phi n, I'm going to just use the shorthand of each and n. Remember that phi n eigenvalues lambda n and that n is what I'm keeping track of and I'm not really going to keep track of the phi. This is just a matter of notation. So just a really good dummy way. Okay. So measurement on an so you initially have a system given to you prepared in a state style. That is what you are given. You are trying to do a measurement of an observable A on that arbitrary state in which it is prepared. So we already argued that it will collapse to one of the eigenstates of the A operator. But which eigenstate nobody knows before measurement. After measurement, the person says, I got AK as the eigenvalue. Once he says, I've got AK as the eigenvalue, then I know that it has collapsed to the state K. I'm writing phi K as K now. Then if you do B measurement immediately after this, what will be the value of B value? It will be BK. Right? So this is what is, the system collapses here. What will be the value we measured immediately after this? We can definitely say even before measuring, it has to be BK. And you can measure and say it is in BK because once it has collapsed to the eigenstate, it is going to remain in that eigenstate. Right? It has collapsed to one of the eigenbases of A operator. But once it has collapsed into the eigenbases of the A operator, it will remain in that eigenbasis, which is the simultaneous eigenbasis for the B operator as well. Because it's compatible observable, both A and B are commuting. That's why even before measurement of B, after you do the measurement of A, you can precisely say what should be the value of the B measurement and you can verify. Okay, what is the next complication we can do? This is what I was trying to say. Suppose the eigenvalues AI of A are degenerate. Let's take A1 to repeat twice. The remaining of them are distinct. Okay, that is what is a degenerate situation. And whereas you take eigenvalues BI to be non-degenerate, B1 to BN are all different. So let's take that simpler situation. So let's take A1 and we tried A1, A2, A3. So let's continue here. A1, A1, A3, A4, A5, dot, 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 and A1. As distinct eigenvalues, there is the degeneracy, twofold degeneracy for the eigenvalues, the first and the second eigenvalues. What does it mean? The state 1 and state 2 
or degenerate. So A operator on state 1 will be A1 times 1. A operator on state 2 is A, A2 I should have written but A2 same as A1 on 2 because of the degeneracy. So now when you do a measurement on an arbitrary state, suppose you take an arbitrary state psi and you try to do a measurement of the A operator. We said it should collapse. What does the experimentalist get? He says I get A1 eigenvalue. Suppose. Can you predict the state now? What can you at most say? It can be either one of them or it could also be a linear superposition of them. When he says he has found eigenvalue as A1, the system state has collapsed to, we can only say, psi collapses to some linear combination of 1 and 2. So, summation over, let us write C L from L where L is 1 to 2. I do not even know what they are. The C L can have a system. Which of this set of C Ls I am measuring, I cannot say without touching the system. You do not know beforehand. You only know that before measurement, it will go into one of the eigenstates for the non-degenerate case. For the degenerate case, you just get an eigenvalue in your hand. That it has collapsed specifically to 1 or specifically to 2, that information you do not have before. Whatever you may say. Think about it. Okay, this is one small scenario which we had taken. So, the collapse of an arbitrary state into a degenerate state of A. Suppose I know that the collapse gives me the degenerate eigenvalues, will not uniquely determine the expectation value for the next immediate measurement of B. This is all I am trying to say. It could be either B1 or B2. We do not know which one. So, this formally I had tried to help you in one particular thing. Suppose measurement of A on an arbitrary state psi goes to KL, where KL is degenerate with eigenvalue AK. Okay, so all the Ls, so you can take L this to be twofold degenerate where L is 1 and 2. This is the example I took. So AK is the same eigenvalue. You could try to rewrite the state in terms of the superposition of the eigenstates of the B operator. No harm doing this. And you will find that the measurement which you do on B operator on an arbitrary KL, it will collapse either to L equal to 1 or, you know, the S equal to 1 or S equal to 2 for a specific case. But which one it will collapse to, you do not know till you measure. If you get the A1 eigenvalue, I know the B, B eigenvalue has to be B1 or B2. That much I can tell. But when you try to do the measurement, it will be either B1 or B2. Which one you will get beforehand, you won't know amongst the two. So, immediately after B measurement, what will A give? So, it will give A1 only. Suppose A1 was the measurement before and then the B measurement, suppose it gave B2. Again, you do an A measurement, it will be A1 only. Okay? Logic is, from non-degenerate to degenerate, nothing will happen. It collapses to a specific eigenvalue. But if you are going from a degenerate to non-degenerate, there is an ambiguity that you can go into a superposed state and then you need to worry about what is the B measurement. So, what is incompatible observables? 
so far we have spent a lot of time on compatible observables and even in compatible observables there are two kinds where one observable can have degenerate eigen values or non degenerate eigen values in non degenerate there is very simple they have the simultaneous eigen basis of both of them in the degenerate case there is some subtlety that you can rotate in that degenerate subspace to write the eigen basis for the b object this is what i have tried to tell you so incompatible observables means they don't commute and we cannot write a simultaneous eigen state of a and b operator so measurement of a followed by measurement of b and again measure a may not give c a same value they not give you the same eigen value same value you agree no this is the key point which plays a very crucial role in the stern gerlach experiment how many of you know about stern gerlach experiment where they can put it through the spins the sense of a magnetic field this will be one of the things which we'll work on in the rest some of this lectures for like and you will see that the measurement of the x component of the spin followed by y again come back to the x you cannot predict it keeps on oscillating you can't say that once i've done the measurement what is the reason that's incompatible some of the incompatible operators i'm sure you are all familiar with suppose i ask you lx ly commutator lx is y p z minus z p y and ly is z p x minus x p y is it use the properties commutator properties and work this out for me and tell me what you get check whether you get this please check this not done the steps but please use them what do you have to use you have to use r i p j s i h cross delta i j use that and prove this that lx ly equal to ih cross lz please prove this exercise for you and once you prove this what can we say about lx and ly compatible or not compatible incompatible observables so if you try to measure lx and then do the measurement of y and again in lx you cannot predict what the lx measurement is in the stern gerlach experiment the intrinsic split which happened of the two beams showed that even though the angular momentum is zero they have some intrinsic quantum number which is spin quantum numbers they also satisfy the same property is what they say okay so those are the incompatible operators which makes the systems much more interesting you do a measurement once you come back and repeat the measurement you get a new result because of this incompatible set of observables a lot of beautiful things happens in the system okay classically classical mechanics you won't think like this but now you know incompatible observables plays a very important also some more things if this is going to act on a finite dimensional vector space the trace of lx ly should be same as trace of ly lx which means trace of lz has to be zero for finite dimensional linear vector space so the matrix representation when i write for lx ly lz so this rule is also you can try to find what is the commutator of ly with lz what do you expect this is just an xyz 
rotation. So this is going to be I H cross L X. So this is the same argument you can show that trace of L X should be zero, trace of L Y to be zero. Here what happens? By the same token, this is an identity operator. Trace on the left hand side, if you do it, is zero. Right hand side, trace of identity, can it be zero? So then we say that we cannot give a matrix representation for an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Matrix representations are possible only for a finite dimensional Hilbert space. That's why this equation is allowed in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And if you claim this is true in finite dimension, then the traces of them have to be zero. So all these properties will be satisfied by the spin operator in Stern Gerlach experiment that they will be traceless. These matrices which we find, they will all be traceless. So it's very consistent. Okay. Okay, so I stop here.